Welcome everyone and thank you for attending today's webcast, Inventor Model-Based Definition. Our presenter today is Kindred Cooper. He is a solutions engineer with Hagerman and Company. We're also joined on the line by Mark Dooley. He is also a solutions engineer with Hagerman and he's on going to be on in the background to answer some questions if you have them during, during the presentation. Uh, before we begin, I'll let you know that you are in listening only mode. Um, but if you have questions during the presentation, you can type those into the question panel, which is located on the right-hand side of your screen. And as I said, uh, Mark will be on in the background to answer any as we go. And there will be a Q&A session at the end as well um, with Kindred. As we close down this session today, you'll be prompted to fill out a short survey. And we do ask that you take a few moments to fill that out. It's just four questions. Um, and it will pop up as we close down the session today. Um, also, all registrants will receive a follow-up email tomorrow, which will contain a link for the recording of today's presentation. And now I'll go ahead and hand things off to Kindred. Thank you, Ashley. Welcome to today's presentation, everyone. We are going to be discussing and showing Autodesk Inventor and model-based definitions. Um, there's some give and take on this title. Uh, a lot of people aren't real sure exactly what it entails, what it covers. Um, we're gonna go through a lot of that. We're gonna go through the interface, um, areas you may want to include these, areas you may not need to include these, things like that. Uh, real quick, just wanna pull up the Q&A slide. Everybody should be hearing me now. This is obviously for individuals who cannot hear me, but it does show the Q&A uh, screen where you can enter your questions and Mark will address them during the presentation. And we're gonna have some time at the end for any unanswered uh, questions. Real quick on Hagerman and Company, as you see by the map, we've got coverage from coast to coast. Our field mechanical technical staff has over 175 years of combined experience. There's a lot of things we've seen and done in various industries. If you encounter a problem that you can't get around or some kind of workflow that's stumping you, uh, chances are one of our guys has lived that life and gone down that road and experienced that same frustration that you have. We are all uh, field experienced uh, mechanical guys. We've we've been out in the trenches with with you all using the software, battling headaches and workflows and things like that. So we've combined together. We've seen a lot of different uh, workflows, solutions, issues, things like that. So chances are somebody has experienced the same thing you are, and we've got the solution for that. As far as software sales and implementation, we've been in business well over 30 years doing CAD software and data management software. We've got a lot of experience to offer and a lot of knowledge to offer in both of those industries. So jumping into it, I've only got a couple of slides and then we get straight into the demonstration, but I got some information we need to exchange here. So model-based definition, what is it really used for? What we're talking about is 3D annotations on the 3D model itself. We're not talking about a shaded view that is a JPEG. We're not talking about a PNG or something like that with some dimensions drawn on it or even a shaded drawing view. We're not talking about that. <clears throat> While that is part of this, we're talking solely about the actual 3D model having in that model space an annotation that stays attached to a feature or an edge. As you orbit around, you see that dimension stay attached to that piece of geometry. This was introduced around Inventor 2018. And typically what happens with a new plugin or a new feature, it takes a couple of years before the industry actually starts catching up. It takes, you know, two or three releases before everybody's like, Hey, wait a minute. I remember somebody talking about this. Can it do this? Yeah, that's exactly what that was designed for. So what we're seeing now is more and more companies are starting to inquire about, hey, can we put annotations on our 3D model? Yeah, it's been there for a number of years already. Uh, in the in the initial release of it, it got a lot of you know flair and broadcast from Autodesk and, and various other outlets, but it didn't really get adoption. There was some curiosity about it, but companies didn't really move move forward with it very much. We're now starting to see that that wave of transition come in, that wave of acceptance. So what is it for? Well, it, it's for 
documenting your design intent. One of the biggest issues with um, documenting a design on 2D is there's a lot of limitations based on the geometry. You're limited to certain views on a flat piece of paper or a flat sheet or a flat document. And a lot of times you cannot convey the design intent accurately enough. The world that I came from, the casting world, we ran into this constantly. There were times that we couldn't generate the view clear enough. We could generate five, six, ten views. A lot of times it still wasn't enough for the pattern guy to fully understand what to do in that area. So this helps clarify a lot of that and remove those barriers for that communication. Makes, makes it much more understandable because you're looking at it in a 3D space. You have access to traditional dimensions and traditional notes. You have access to GD&T. You have expanded notations. You also have a tolerance advisor and tolerance analysis that can be ran in the 3D model. You can collaborate across different platforms. You're not confined to just doing this in Inventor because we can export it to 3D PDF. We can also export it to a step 242 format. Now, this is important. The step 242 standardization is not the default export setting for step files. You have to go into the options and change that. We'll look at that. It's just a, a bubble selection. But the 242 is important because that is machine readable. So you can plug it into your CNC, your CMM. It's the newer standardization that incorporates those annotations. <clears throat> The interface is a separate tab in Inventor for annotations. Uh, it's got its own set of commands. So this is not the same command that's gonna be used in sketches to create dimensions. It's not the same command that's gonna be used in drawing views to create dimensions. It does have its own set of dimension and hold and thread note commands. It is standard driven. So if you open an older model, you may see the dialog that's down here in the lower right as um, soon as you go to apply a tolerance or a dimension, you may see this dialog pop up and it's going to ask you what standard do you want to utilize or adhere to uh, for these dimensions. And you can choose ASME, ASME millimeter, DIN or ISO. You can also set this in the document settings of your model. But if it's not set because you're dealing with an older model file, it will prompt you as soon as you try to create a 3D annotation. There are some gotchas with this, and not gotchas in a bad way. There's just things to be aware of. So what works in a 2D, 2D view may not work in a 3D view. One of the biggest things I'm talking about here is clutter. When you're working in a 3D view, if you look at this shaded isometric that I have over to the right, Everything is spaced out, easy to see. Granted, you got some different text on different orientation planes, but it's, it's clear to see. In a 2D view, you can still get cluttered. If you have too many dimensions on a view, you can still overpower that view, and it can be hard to read and understand. The same thing applies to 3D. You've got to be very aware of your clutter, of your spacing, of your organization, of your dimensions. The software is not going to do it for you. It's not going to clean it up for you. Also, a 2D view or 2D drawing may not even be necessary depending on your situation. You could do 3D model annotations and that cover everything for everybody who's going to look at this. Uh, they may have the one model file with all the annotations on there and they don't need a print. They can go in there and see exactly what they need to machine it to, mold it to, whatever. Uh, you may have the 3D is needed to support or augment the 2D. There is an option when you export to a PDF, you can choose to include an attachment with that PDF, and that could be the step file that gets, uh, gets generated and transmitted with it. So the 3D is there to either stand by itself or to augment the existing or forthcoming two-dimensional drawing that you're going to create. Uh, 3D allows for multi-directional compliance. So you've got a surface that is supposed to be flat within a certain tolerance, flat in what direction. That's where the 3D can really come in and clarify a lot of things. You can set the annotation plane to be certain orientations and certain angles. 
and that can help clarify to say, okay, flatness of you know one thousandth of an inch in this planar direction, and then flatness of three thousandths of an inch in the other planar direction. So that can help clarify the design intent a lot of times. Where can these be used? Well, you can use them in your standard IPT, your standard 3D model part file. You can also use them in sheet metal IPTs and sheet metal flat patterns. Now there's a little gotcha in that flat pattern. You may go in there and say, okay, well, I can use them in here and then I can export to a PDF. That's, that's one of the big things about this is not just applying the annotations, but generating that neutral format PDF for everybody to share and collaborate with. That's where the gotcha lies on the flat pattern, and I'll show you once we get in there. But you can also use this in assemblies. The one area that it does not work uh, currently is if you wanted to generate a high resolution rendering out of studio. Currently, Inventor Studio does not support 3D annotations. There's been talk about it, but at, at the current release of 2021, it does not support the 3D annotations in a rendering uh, done out of Inventor Studio. You can still export just from the model environment going up to the file pull down, go to export to a JPEG or PNG, and you'll get the annotations with that image but it's not gonna be a high resolution rendering with lights and shadows and things like that. It'll be what you see on the screen. But as you see, we can do it to piece parts, sheet metal, the flat pattern you'll see on the screen there, as well as assemblies. So let's just go ahead and jump right into it. Okay, in Inventor, I'm gonna open up a standard piece part. And right now there are no annotations on this. Standard 3D model. You've got your extrusions, your sketches, things of that nature. If you want to start adding those 3D annotations, if you look across the top of Inventor, you'll see the file ribbon tab, 3D model, sketch ribbon, and there's the annotate ribbon tab. When I click on annotate, there's not a lot of commands in here. It's pretty well streamlined and pretty well thought out. You don't need a lot of fluff to do this. You've got access to most of the traditional dimension commands. And the reason I say most is there's a handful here or there, just a couple that aren't available, at least not in an automated sense. Uh, first off, you've got the tolerance feature where you can come in and actually specify surfaces or edges and apply a tolerance feature frame to that. Actually, I meant to pick that cylinder. Uh, it identifies it automatically as a simple hole. You can change that. If there are multiple holes drilled, it will recognize that. You can include those in the set. You can apply that, and as you see, it gives me an annotation out in space. Now, notice very carefully how this annotation is arranged. Notice the orientation of the text, the orientation of the leader arrow, you also notice there is a plane showing up right there. It's the top surface plane. Depending on what you select, you will have some flexibility to change orientations. It's gonna be confined to your type of geometry and what you're actually specifying, but the tab key and the space bar on your keyboard are vital to switching these up. So if you want to change the text orientation, you can hit the tab key and that will flip it to another orientation. In this particular one, there's only two options, one orientation or the other. Now you can also sometimes hit the space bar and change the annotation plane. For this particular one, that does not work. We've only got the one plane that's associated with this cylinder. Change back to that annotation, I'm gonna place the annotation here just by left clicking in space. And then you get a mini toolbar that comes up. And in the mini toolbar is where you can set all the little intricacies of your particular annotation you're creating. So we've got the diameter of the hole, we've got a tolerance that's applied to it if you want that tolerance or not. We've got the GDNT callout for straightness or circularity or cylindricity of this. You've got the tolerance value for that showing up. 
uh, you've got the datum reference that gets identified as reference A. Again, it's a simple hole. We can choose to toggle the datum feature on and off. You can add additional nomenclature segments to this, insert text above, insert text below. And again, you can continue on and add other features or just apply that dimension. When you apply that, the tolerance advisor pops up. That's this little window over here. You can turn this off at will. It's not required. And also I want to point out, it is not a giant red flag. You're doing something wrong. If you see things showing up in here, this is simply an advisor. It doesn't mean anything that's called out is wrong or is required. Again, it's simply an advisor. You get some information feedback from this. Um, one or more surfaces are un, unconstrained, okay? A lot of these messages or, or warnings can be very cryptic. So what you can do is you can double click on them and they will open up in a web browser. So when I open these up, it gives me a breakdown or a definition of what that's actually calling out or what it's actually referencing. And you can do that with every single one of these. Um, here's a feature control frame. Form tolerance must be smaller than the size tolerance. Okay, so what is that referring to? So when I bring up that note, what it's actually referring to, if I look back at the dimension, there's a lot of fluff in there to basically say that the cylindricity form tolerance, this 0.08 inches, cannot be larger than the tolerance of the primary dimension. That's really what it's telling me. So I need to adjust the 0.08 to be somewhere less than this tolerance here. That's simply done by double clicking on the note, click that text field and plug in point say 003. Now when I say okay, what you're gonna see over in the tolerance advisor is that warning message will disappear or should if I did it right. Uh, again, this is just feedback. It does not say you have to come here and make this adjustment. It's more or less looking over your shoulder to make sure you're, you're kind of adhering to standards. And when you look at the different annotation types we can create, everything is driven by an ASME standard. And what I have noticed, especially with things like surface textures is everybody kind of uses the standard for symbology, but then their nomenclature and notes for that particular surface texture kind of goes wherever they want it to go. Everybody uses it to their own translation, I guess you could say. Um, the dimension command, you select your various features and edges you want to dimension. So let's say for example, we're going to dimension the center point to center point of the slotted cutout in the top angled face. So I'm just gonna select the circular edge and the circular edge defaults to center point to center point and you'll notice the plane orientation. This may be perfectly fine with you. You can hit the tab key to change the text orientation. That may be just fine, no problem. You can hit the space bar to change to a different plane orientation. That could work too. You can also align it to certain faces. If you right click, you'll notice various options to change on your 3D annotation. You can toggle the alignment, that's the tab key. Uh, you can toggle to the next candidate plane, that's the space bar where it goes vertical or goes horizontal either in the Y direction or the X direction, or you can select the annotation plane you want it to align with. There's also a line to geometry on certain types of dimensions, especially things like a tolerance feature. You can align the text to a piece of geometry like an edge. So I'm gonna change the annotation plane to be the top face of this angled uh, leg. And you'll see there, it aligns it to that. I may have to, again, change the text orientation, but that it, it's simple hit of the tab key. That's the orientation I'm going for on this. So I'll go ahead and apply that dimension. Again, you have control to plug in tolerance values if you wish, add any additional 
text lines to this call out, add additional dimensions. So it will apply that one and continue on to where you can keep adding more dimensions. This also works if you're doing uh, surface to surface for angular measures. You'll notice where it put the actual dimension. When I spin around, it basically lined it up with the two points that I selected. And when I say points, I'm not talking actual work points or anything like that. I'm just talking arbitrary surface points of where I select the geometry. So it's kind of floating out in model space, if you will. It is attached or associated to those faces, but I would rather have it up here on the front leading face. So again, that's where you can right click, select the annotation plane, pick that end face, and it moves it up to be on that plane on that vector edge. Placement of this, you know, if I wanted up here, down here, it does do including or outside angle measures. Again, keep adding a few more, maybe do the same thing over here. We'll apply to make sure everybody knows those are the same directions. Same thing here, I'll just select a different annotation plane to get it up front. Now, when I said earlier that not all of your traditional dimension commands are available, at least not the automatic ones. What I was referring to is like the chamfer note. There is no chamfer call out up here. There is a general leader note that I can put in and say, okay, well, let's attach it to that surface. And likewise, you can hit the shift or the space bar to change the arrowhead and call out orientation. You can hit the tab key to change the text orientation based on where you're at. You'll notice the leg does change based on what side of the arrowhead you're on. So right here, the leg is going off to the right. When I come back over, it goes off to the left. So it is following those drafting standards. Looking at that plane orientation, no, I'm not gonna, not gonna dig that too well. I want it to match the 135 degree measures. So I'll change to, with the space bar, I'll change to this plane direction. Now, if one doesn't come up, a lot of times with the leader text, you can right click and pick a different annotation plane. The tolerance feature, depending on what you pick, you may not always have that option. But with leader text in general, you, you usually do. I'm um, gonna we'll go ahead and place it here and you can call it out to say, say eighth inch, um, 45 degree chamfer. And okay. <clears throat> you can also use the general dimension command to call out diameters, radiuses, same thing here. Tab and spacebar allows you to change the planar directions. And then when you're dealing with something like a drilled or tapped or cut hole, uh, you can use the hole and thread note. That is one command they did bring over from the traditional commands. And just like in a drawing view, it doesn't really matter what you pick on that whole feature, it's all gonna have the same information. So the, whether I pick the threaded uh, or the threads of the hole, go ahead and just change that orientation. You see it's calling out quarter inch, uh, one and a quarter inch, 16 UN. It's got the counterbore depth, counterbore diameter, thread depth. You've got access to come in and add and change for what type of hole. Uh, you can use a different type of coordinate system if you need. I'm going to do this again, but now I'm going to pick the counterbore cylinder. First time I picked the threaded cylinder. I'm going to pick the counterbore this time, and you'll see that I get the exact same note. You can also pick the edge, and again, you get the exact same note. So it's showing you that it, just like the drawing view, it ties it back to the model geometry, ties it to the information used to create that feature. And if that model changes, if that feature changes, of course, these notes are going to adjust with it. As you create these notes, get rid of the extra there. As you create these over in the tree, you'll notice there is an annotations folder that shows up that shows you each one of the annotations that you have created. So there is the top linear dimension I created, then the angular dimension, second angular dimension, so on and so forth. 
Um, if you want to delete these, you can simply select them out of the modeling area, hit delete, or you can control select and shift select over in the tree and delete multiples at once. Uh, surface textures, you do have access to the surface texture symbology. This kind of goes to what I was saying earlier where um, you have access to the standard symbology, but companies tend to kind of do their own thing with the, the nomenclature in here. Uh, applying the symbol, you have access in the mini toolbar to all the notations for it. I have seen various companies do various things that do not conform with the standard on putting certain notes in certain locations. So you have access to the symbol, you have access to adjust the symbology, to include certain parameters, do a full wraparound symbology, plug in whatever values you want. I've seen people do something like this <clears throat> to input uh, the note for the machining surface. I've seen them put it here, I've seen them put it here, I've seen them put it here. So the, nomen the, the notation of it and the information that goes in here kind of seems to be up in the air for who's putting what where, but you have the standard symbology available at your disposal. <clears throat> um, you also have access to a general notes item. Now what this does is it allows you to put a general note on the graphics plane has nothing to do with X, Y, Y, Z, X, Z, none of that, isometric, no. It just stays wherever you put it. So for example, um, we could put in here and say a general note, um, say all surfaces to be machined, actually to be finished to 16 blanche, uh, max per gauge. And that is a general note that stays on the graphics window, regardless of your view orientation, your view zoom, or any of that. That note stays in that orientation on the graphics window. And again, it shows up here in your annotations folder in your modeling tree. This can also be displayed on a drawing view uh, if you're making a 2D drawing of it. You also have a general profile note that you can plug in, much the same factor here. It is a graphics plane note that stays just on the screen and comes in with the uh, surface and tolerance uh, GD&T symbology, I should say. As far as the annotations go, you may find some of these are hard to read or maybe they're too large. You do have control over the annotation scaling. If you look here in the manage panel of the annotate ribbon, there is a, an area that allows you to pull it down and change the annotation scaling. If you do a one-to-one, -one, the annotation is gonna shrink down. If you do a two-to-one, they're gonna get larger. These are not controlled by your application options. There is a, a section in your application options on the general tab that has annotation scale. 3D annotations are not governed by this setting. This setting applies to your sketches, uh, the dimensions and text that, that shows up on your uh, sketches. The 3D annotations do not conform to this value. So you do have two different areas to control this. The other nice thing about this is you can incorporate and utilize the geometry and the dimensions that you've already created. So let's look through the modeling tree a little bit. We've got in extrusion one, we've got this sketch with the various dimensions on it. I could use some of those. Maybe we're gonna come down to, um, we're gonna go to this one right here. Look at sketch five. There's a couple of dimensions right here that I wanna use, I wanna reuse, I should say. What I can do is I can right click on sketch five in the browser tree, go down and turn on visibility. Now that displays those dimensions just like it always has. I need to get these promoted as 3D annotations. So what you're gonna do is you're just gonna right click on the dimension you want and there is a promote option. When I click promote, it shows up both. So it doesn't change or convert that dimension from the sketch, it doesn't do that. It essentially gives you a copy of it in the 3D annotation form. The original dimension on the sketch is still there. 
unchanged, but it just gave us this copy in the 3D space. Same thing applies to this guy. I wanna use him, right click, promote. The beauty about these, I can now turn off sketch five, turn off the visibility of it. The beauty about these is I can relocate them, clean them up, move them around, but they are pulling in their tolerances as specified in the dimension properties or as specified in the parameters. So if I come into the sketch, if I come into the original sketch five, for example, and I right click on this and say, well, we'll do this one, where I click on this one and I'll go to dimension properties, I'm gonna change the deviation instead of plus seven thousandths, I'll give them a little bit more leeway and we'll say 10 thousandths. Still minus nothing, we're gonna maintain the minimum condition. Finish my sketch, that 3D annotation changed automatically. It's pulling that same information. So you don't have to repeat the process of you know, re-promoting it or anything like that. This is one of the gotchas also that I was warning you about is clutter, keeping your model clean. So for example, this may be the wrong view or the wrong orientation to have that note. So I may wanna pull it out here as such. That'll clean up that a little bit. I kind of don't need this one anymore so much. I mean, I could still have it there as a, a secondary call out if I wish. Maybe toggle the alignment to a different alignment factor and clean it up just a little bit. That's, that's better. Um, still, you can read it and understand what's going on. The other thing that you can do is you can incorporate different design views with this. So every piece part and every assembly has design view representations. So if you look over in the tree at the very top on a piece part, you'll see view colon, usually you see view colon master, that's what's listed here. Uh, but you also have front, top, isometric, you can create whatever you want. The nice thing about this is if I go to the, let's get rid of that note so we can see that a little bit clearer. Uh, just take that one off. Actually, let's edit. Now I'll just take it off be easier. If I click on the front face of the view cube, you'll notice I see three dimensions. Well, I'm actually seeing more than that. I'm seeing these dimension notes up here. They're just showing up as blue lines. If I click to the top face, I see dimensions readable from the top face. Uh, again, same thing. There are still dimensions here. There's the chamfer note as a blue line out in space. We can clean these up. Here's how, when I'm looking at, let's go to the front design view rep. Okay, so that changes my view orientation. I'm looking at the front orientation of it. I don't want any of these other blue line dimensions to show up. So what I can do is actually, I can actually right click on them, turn off their visibility for this particular view rep association. Same thing over here. Turn off visibility of that guy, turn off visibility of that one. There's probably another one back here in the background. And if you want to, you can change your filter selection to only select annotations. That make things a lot easier to select. So now I can just right click, uncheck visibility. That should be all of them. Oh, nope, there was a radius right there. So I'll just turn him off. And then there's that note, I'll turn him off. So I'll go back to my front cube orientation that saves my display orientation with that design view rep. Go to my top view, you see everything comes back. So now I can look and, well, jury's still out if I wanna use these two for the top view, I'll keep them, it's okay. I'll get rid of this chamfer note. I don't need that on my top view. I don't need the two angular measures so I can turn those off as well. You'll notice I'm not deleting them, I'm turning off their visibility. So go back to my top view, save that, go back to my front, cycle back to my top, and only those dimensions for that view rep are showing. So that allows you to tweak the information being displayed. Go to isometric and everything comes back. Now, one of the purposes of doing all of this is to get this information outside of Inventor, get it out into a neutral format that other facilities, other computers, other users can get access to. And that's where the 3D PDF comes in handy. 
So when I export to a 3D PDF, I get the options to export all of my iPart or uh, iProperty information. So if you've got anything that you want to plug in as far as uh, stock number, summary fields, all of these are util uh, you can utilize every single one of these on the project description, rev, uh, vendor it may be going to, estimated cost, any of your custom fields, all of this information can be included on that 3D PDF. And you can choose what gets sent out. When you generate this, you've got control over the visualization quality. If you're using a particular PDF template, of course, where you're gonna save the PDF that gets generated. And then you can generate and attach a step file to include with this PDF. <clears throat> the options for this allows you to configure which standard a, of step file to create. And this is where I was talking about it in the presentation. The 242 standard is the newest standard that allows this information to be directly read into machine code, into CMMs, uh, CNCs, and various other uh, CAD products when you open up a step file that has 3D annotations, it will show them in the model. I'll actually show you that here in a second. Uh, so make sure you have the 242 selected. <clears throat> then when I hit publish, it actually generates that PDF and it, it'll attempt to open it in your default web browser. I, I believe mine is going to open in Microsoft Edge. That or Google Chrome, one of the two. Um, when it opens it, actually that time it did not, so good. Let me do it this way. When it opens it, it'll probably open it like this. Uh, this is Microsoft Edge. There's nothing to display. Uh, you open it in Chrome, there may not be anything to display. You open it in Firefox, there may not be anything to display. The reason for that is the web browser companies are kind of playing catch up with Adobe right now. Um, the plugins, if there is a plugin out there, uh, I've seen some of the uh, plugins for Firefox be a little buggy, and that's really what you're seeing here. However, if you open this in Acrobat Reader, let me pull it over from the other screen. This is actually a different file. I'll open up this exact one here in a second. If you open it up in Acrobat Reader, it still may not show because you may have to come in here to your preferences. You can thank Adobe for this. Come into your preferences and go to the 3D and multimedia call out and enable the playing of 3D content. As soon as you check that, then it'll show the model geometry and everything. So let me actually open the model that I just generated, which I believe is that one. Yeah, it goes to the other window. Here we go. All right, so there's the model I just generated. Here's all the notes and everything I applied during this session. This is not a JPEG. It is not a screenshot. It is a 3D space that you can orbit around. You've got various commands in here controlled and assigned by Adobe um, to spin, pan, zoom, walk around, fly around, things like that. You can change the different display states. You can have different lighting effects if it's shaded and things like that. You can also take some uh, section cuts in here, uh, make notes on it, all that fun stuff. The nice thing about this is the PDF is generated using the different named design views that you created. So right now I'm looking at the isometric down here at the bottom. If I go to the top view, it changes to that top view orientation and only shows me the dimensions for that top view. Same thing happens in the front view. So these are the design view reps. So you can have your own custom ones that are named. They could be called out by a detail call out, a figure number and a manual. And kind of the sky's the limit here on how you can arrange these and organize them to communicate design intent. And again, you can zoom in, zoom out, pan around. Of course, you can print this out uh, for for transportation out to the shop or out to the machine, but at least they can come in here and they can get access to that 3D information. They can say, okay, wait a minute. Uh, what exactly is this dimension, this 0.118 going to? And one thing you may notice getting in here and, and digging around with the 3D PDF, the text alignment, let me say that correctly, the text orientation in the 3D PDF 
may not match what inventor created or what inventor had assigned. Uh, this is a situation with Adobe because they don't have the code written to where it automatically adjusts based on your view angle. Um, whereas Inventor, they've got it plugged into where as you create it, you can change that orientation. Adobe doesn't have that yet. So some of the text may be backwards or may be looking at it from a different plane, but the great thing is you can just kind of orbit around, change your orientation, and you can read that text and, and get that information. That's the beauty about the 3D PDF is you have access to that 3D space. This is more of an issue in assemblies, and here's why. If I open up an assembly, by default, if I start a new assembly in Inventor and I go to an isometric view, notice my XYZ triad. My X is going down towards the pointing towards the lower right, Y is pointing straight up, and Z is pointing out to lower left. If you go to an architectural product, that is not the orientation of X, Y, and Z. Z is pointing from the ground to the sky and that's kind of how adobe has geared 3d pdf manufacturing is a little bit different z always comes out at the screen the ground is the xz plane that's kind of traditionally how it's been but in the architectural world the ground plane is the xy plane so we're in that kind of battle of back and forth of who's got the right orientation so when you create a 3d pdf from an assembly that's definitely when you're going to have text and annotations come in backwards. So for example, if I come in here to the annotate portion and let's just say right there is the active standard, I'm going to specify ASME and I'll just for clarification's sake so people can see it, these two alignment or these two pins are different lengths. So I need to call that out. I'm going to apply that one and I'll apply this one. Same thing, changing my text orientation just for clarity purposes. You can get, you know, maybe a whole note on here to call this out, make sure it's understood what size that is, things like that. Okay, so if I just go ahead and say, let's send this out to PDF and I'll publish it. I already did it before, so I'm going to override it. Creates the PDF. Notice my XYZ orientation on this. If I go and I open that PDF with Acrobat that always comes up on the other screen, notice the orientation is off. It does not match what was in, in Inventor. So if I, if I flip this around to exactly what Inventor had, the same model orientation, notice the text. The text is not in the proper orientation. Again, that, that goes back to mechanical does it one way, architectural does it another way, and Adobe kind of geared this around architectural orientation. Not a big deal. I mean, we just flip this thing around in order to read it. That's what this whole purpose is for, so we can get in here and read and see where are these measures, measurements coming from, where are these notations coming from. Um, you're also given the ability to do this in sheet metal. And you'll, you'll remember from the presentation, I mentioned there's a little bit of a gotcha with the sheet metal. So I'm gonna show you what that is. So if I go to a sheet metal component, you've got a folded and a flat. So in the folded, same, same. I have access to all of the same information, all of the same dimensions, all of the same capabilities, changing text orientation, changing text plane if I, if I want to. applying notes, things of that nature. Now, when I get to, and, and I can export to 3DF, uh, 3D PDF right here. When I get to the flat, same deal. I can come in here to the 3D annotations. I can apply dimensions, change my plane. Let's go ahead and apply some center line bend. Oh, missed it. Try again, some center line bend notes. And you'll notice on here, you don't have access to the actual bend note command like you do in a sheet metal drawing view. That is one of the differences in here. We'll go ahead and note that bend center. 
and center to center on these. So I put a few dimensions on here. Here's the gotcha for flat patterns on sheet metal. Notice the 3D PDF is grayed out. So your instinct might say, well, then I can't generate a PDF. You know, this, this doesn't really help a lot on the flat. You still can, it's just grayed out here. If you come up to the file pull down, go to export, you do have access to export the PDF there. And it will generate that PDF with the annotations as shown here. So why it's grayed out in the actual flat, I'm not 100% sure uh, why they restricted it here, but gave you access in the file pull down. Could be the same reason why you can make modifications in the flat that can't be converted back to the 3D. They might have done this just to separate the two environments from a folded to a flat. But you do have access to do that. On the drawing view, when you have drawing, a need for a drawing, I should say, and you have a drawing view, those annotations can save you some time. For many, many, many moons now, we've had the ability to retrieve model annotations. And when we do that now with the incorporation of 3D annotations, if I select a view, then I get access to those 3D annotations that I created. You'll notice right here, I can choose what design view to reference. I can look at the front view, I can look at the top view, I can look at the isometric or even the master. And what this allows me to do is include or not include certain dimensions. So let's say for example, um, I don't wanna, I wanna include these two for the groove and maybe the whole note call out and maybe one of the angle dimensions. That's all I'm gonna include for the isometric at this time. Say, okay, when I come over here to another view, let's say the front view, for example, and I invoke that command, you'll notice even when I go to the master, which should show me everything, I don't get access to everything. This is the neat functionality about this. It limits what I have access to and what I can see based on what is being used in other views. So for example, the 135 degree dimension out here at the lower left corner is not accessible in the front view. Even though I'm looking at the master design view rep, I don't have access to it because Inventor knows, hey, that dimension is used over here. Uh, same thing goes for if I did to the top view, the dimensions in the groove would not be available up here. I do have access to the chamfer note and the degree measure because they were not used here say okay, and it applies them there. If I go to a top view and retrieve those, I get access to this feature call out because it was removed from up here. Well, what if I wanted the whole note to be used over here? What I can do is I can go to the isometric, delete it, come back to my top view, retrieve the annotations there, and now I have access to that whole note. So it, it follows the drafting standard of not duplicating dimensions or not creating reference dimensions. And it does follow the standard of, or the standard workflow and the practice of, if you need a reference dimension, then you have to manually create it. So that can save a lot of time and eliminate a lot of confusion. So with that, we will jump over to Mark and check on the Q&A. Mark, how are we looking? Well, so far we only have one question coming in, and that one is regarding the rendering that you were talking about early on, and that is, what if you turn on ray tracing to get the high resolution models in your model space? Very good question. And here I thought I had the system beat when I thought about that a few weeks ago. Um, when you look at your 3D model, when I change to realistic mode and I turn on ray tracing, they vanish. So the only way you can get them, there, well, there's no way to get a rendering and include the annotations without a lot of extra work in an image processing software like 
Photoshop or PaintShop Pro or something like that. There are ways to do it that way. The only way to get this image here and include the annotations is under the file menu, export to an image. You can generate a bitmap, a GIF, JPEG, PNG, or a TIFF image, and they will contain the model geometry, the current shading, and those dimensions. Thank you, sir. So, uh, another question coming in. A position FCF can be added to a linear dimension in the model, correct? Is that correct what? or incorrect? Um, so, can a uh, position FCF be added to a linear dimension? I think you're breaking up on the audio. A position what? Sorry about that. Is that better? A little bit. All right. So the question is, can say a position FCF be added to a linear dimension in, in the model? Linear dimension, no. You would need the tolerance feature command to do that. Okay. And then another question here. Will Inventor bring in the model-based definition during a step 242 import from other CAD systems? I forgot to show that. Yes, yes, let me show that. Um, that was one of the things I wanted to uh, showcase. So I've already exported to a step 242. There is this particular model. Actually, I'll close it down so we're not getting confused on what we're looking at. Let me close this down as well. So when you utilize the 242 standard, if another product opens that step file, and if they support that 242 standard fully, then they will see the model-based definitions. Kind of the same thing can happen here because you'll notice that some of the notations are backwards on the text. Uh, just depends on what plane uh, they were used to create uh, those annotations. But if you if you export a step, if you just go through the default and you don't you don't tweak anything, it's not going to export the proper uh, standard. So, for example, if I come in here, let me just put a couple on here real quick, uh, just for show and tell purposes. And one more. Okay, so if I come up here and I do, let me do a save and do a save copy as and I change to a step file by default I don't think I don't think inventor remembers this it may um, but by default it's going to be set to a 214 that's the it's either 203 or 214 214 was the the older standard uh, the most most recent before 242 was created um, it's going to be set to the 214 you'll have to come into options and actually change it to a 242 in order to include those annotations so if somebody sends you a step file and they're like, yeah, you know, here's the annotations and you open it up and it ain't got any, they didn't create it with the 242 standard. They didn't go in there and tweak their options. Thank you, sir. Um, one more. Can the general leader be smart? Um, I guess that's more on the intelligence side of iProperties maybe, but your 1-8 chamfer was typed in instead of using model geometry. The leader text and the note text there's a little bit of a difference you'll notice leader text you can access properties of the model you can access physical properties of the model you can also pull in model parameters you can tie it to it but it doesn't automatically recognize it so if you do have a, a chamfer size in there you need to come in here and name that parameter that dimension uh, to chamfer or whatever it is, counterbore, diameter, you know, whatever you're going to call it, and you'll have to manually plug it in here. The command itself is not going to automatically recognize that feature and pull in that information for you. It's just a manual edit. Manual edit. All right, and here is another one kind of along the same lines from Wesley. Uh, can the leader notes read I properties of selected parts? His example is in the assembly. Uh, a part that has an I property tied to its quantity, which would update when more parts are added or deleted 
uh, the leader note would update when the I property is updated. Yeah, anything listed here in the text field, so say I properties of the model, if you have a custom I property that you've built, you can pull it from this list. Uh, a good example may be a description. That, that's one thing is in an assembly, you can use these to bubble label your components in a 3D shaded view, um, very much like we do on a 2D drawing view, uh, but it'll be supported for the 3D PDF. And you can actually plug in instead of, well, I mean, you could do description, but you could also do part number, stock number, description. You could do various fields in here and bubble label your components in an assembly. So it's not just for dimensioning, it's also for identification purposes. Thank you, sir. And that is all the questions we have so far. Okay. Well, thank you everyone for watching today's webinar. Hope you enjoyed it. And any questions that come in afterwards, uh, we will get those through the GoToMeeting system and we will address those separately. Hope everyone has a great day.